Hey everybody, is this on well enough? Okay, great. Um, hi, thanks Sophie. I'm Meryl Dakin. Um, I'm a founding engineer at NOC, where we build notification infrastructure for developers. I've been an Elixir developer for about four years now. Previously, I was a student and then a teacher at the Flatiron School. That's a web development boot camp. Um, and I mention that because I think that that perspective is going to be helpful and relevant to the way that I am approaching this talk. As somebody who switched into this field later in my career, I sometimes felt like I was missing some playbook other people had for a development team. I wasn't sure what it meant to be an effective or impactful developer or how to best contribute to my team. So I started pattern matching, but not the Elixir kind. This is what happens when you get your first ticket at a new company, or maybe you're in an unfamiliar part of your code base. First, you have to orient yourself to the space. So I'm understanding the existing code flow, looking through previous PRs made to the area. I'm noticing the shape of functions and how the modules are named and the boundaries of the context. And as I'm writing my solution, maybe I'm referencing the code around it and trying to keep it consistent with what's already there. When I'm preparing for a PR review, I'm looking at my code through the eyes of a reviewer, trying to catch the places I'm breaking from convention before they do. What's happening is that I'm looking for patterns and I'm trying to match those patterns. And why am I doing that? When we create and maintain patterns in a code base, it gives us the ability to move much faster and communicate with a lot more clarity. It means once you know the patterns, you can be dropped in anywhere and have your bearings when you're starting on a new project. You also gain speed in onboarding new teammates and contractors. They can start working right away because they can see how the code base is structured. And the same goes for hiring a developer without as much Elixir experience. They can become productive far more quickly because it's easier to mimic patterns that are already there. But I think maintaining strong conventions gives us more than just team efficiency. When we write code, we're translating a product vision into application. But we're also communicating with our future selves and our future colleagues. We're planning for a time when we won't be around or remember enough to explain what we were thinking when we wrote it. The code we write also exists in a specific time and context. It has a lot of considerations that might not be visible in six months or a few years after it's in production. It might have been the perfect solution at the time, but eventually it's going to have to evolve to meet a shifting product vision or new technology. So if we want our code to outlast ourselves, we write it so that it makes sense to future developers. We want them to be able to maintain it as we would. I think we can all imagine the type of person who might not consider this in their work. You might have worked with them, or maybe you've just seen their GitHub username in the commit flow of your projects. They've written code that works, but it's very hard to follow. You find yourself jumping around a lot of files. Maybe there's more abstractions than are necessary. It breaks from previous patterns in the code base, and there aren't tests or documentation. I imagine that that person totally understood the problem when they wrote it, and they wrote the best solution at the time. But they also thought they would be around forever to answer questions about it. And unfortunately, they aren't. And here's you trying to piece the mystery together. So when I think about superstar developers, it isn't this person. Yes, they can write good code, but this code topples over when they're gone. They connect the code with their own mind map instead of the shared patterns of the team. And they make themselves indispensable so that if they leave, the feature can't be easily maintained or built on. And the thing is, we've all been this person, haven't we? I know I can think of PRs I've made without good communication in mind. This is all of our problems to solve. How do we divorce our own mind map from our code? How do we communicate in a shared language for the success of our project and for the mental health of our teammates? I said before that when I started in this field, I wasn't sure what behaviors made a good teammate and a good developer. I think what good behavior means now is essentially being a good neighbor to our future selves and our teammates. Because we're not just writing code for the computer, we're writing it for other humans to read. If we write code that follows those patterns already sat up in an application, we know it's going to stay in our team's shared vocabulary. We know it will stay clear as the code base evolves. And high-performing teams of any field have this in common. They've built shared context and conventions so they can communicate with much less friction. So I'm going to have to stop and apologize for this next part because I am going to give you a sports analogy. I was uh, explaining this kind of person to my husband. He doesn't code, but he does watch football. And when I described the kind of person on a team who I think of as a superstar, he said, oh, so you want someone who's Tom Brady? 
And I was like, I think we don't like Tom Brady for some reason. He was like, we don't like him, but we do respect him. I was like, okay. But he explained that Tom Brady is not a showy quarterback. He's very methodical and follows plays he and his team have practiced. And so even when he's not there, the team still has success with backup quarterbacks because they're continuing to follow the plays they've practiced. And they've won seven Super Bowls doing this. And I think this is such a funny picture. Um, my husband named some other quarterbacks who have had the opposite effect. They are wildly talented and they do these superstar athletic moves to pull out wins in dire situations. But when they're not there, the team suffers because they built themselves around a single person rather than a shared mode of execution. I am not gonna name those other quarterbacks because I do not want you to talk to me about them. If you do wanna talk about Ted Lasso, you can do that and there's like kind of the same situation there, so I've watched that show. But that is the core of this talk, implementing strong patterns in our code base and the behaviors that help maintain them. They lead to high performing and happy teams. And so we're going to start by delving into being a good neighbor with our patterns. And what is the rule of being a good neighbor? Good fences. Good fences or boundaries in our application mean that each piece of the project have a defined role to do. Having a separation of concerns within our code makes it easy to know where to add new functionality and prevents our logic from getting spread out throughout the application. The Elixir ecosystem gives us an incredible set of tools to do this. We have Phoenix, which already gives us the separation between the web layer and the core business logic. We have the concept of context to contain code for specific domains. Within functions, we have tools like pattern matching to make branching logic easy and clear. Unlike languages like Ruby, where we can rely on inheritance, we can use alias and import to clearly demonstrate where our functions are coming from. So we've got plenty of resources to communicate with clear intention. But we also deeply rely on convention to get us there, because it's possible to just write all of our queries and executions in our web controllers. So let's start by talking through this high level of organization in a Phoenix Elixir web project and identifying the singular purpose of each of these parts. So for demo purposes, I'll be pretending that I'm building a simple API as one of my favorite applications, which is Letterboxd. This is a social app for storing and sharing movies that you wanna see. And if you have it, you can follow me at, at Merle. That's Merle with six R's. So here's how we're thinking of these layers in relation to each other. The web layer is responsible for request routing and response. The service layer contains instructions to coordinate these requests and execute them. Workers are delegated to by the service layer, and they invoke the service layer for asynchronous work. And then the schema layer contains our entity definitions and interfaces with the database. This can kind of be thought of as a subcategory of the service layer as well. I do want to acknowledge that the separation of concerns is very web development centric. And the code examples that we're going to be looking at are also going to be in that arena. But we can also apply this to a more generic category, like a client boundary, service layer, persistence management. So the most important takeaway is that we're making these clear lines and we have a separation of concerns. Um, each one has a singular purpose. So let's start with the web layer. This is uh, the web layer of this Letterbox movie app. Um, we're in the movie controller. Its job is to intake data, send it somewhere else, and return a result. It should be totally agnostic about what happens to it, only that it should return okay or an error. Um, this is the show endpoint, so we should be getting an ID and giving back a movie from that ID. Um, all the validation it's doing here is checking that it's actually a movie struct. But let's say that I wanna add to this. I wanna get genres along with this movie because I know that I want that request to happen at the same time. I could add that right here in the controller, but should I? As a developer looking at this code, I didn't really need to know about preloads happening at this spot in time. It clutters the purpose of the module. And I'll still have to dig into this get by ID function to see if anything else is happening because maybe I've nested more preloads in there. Maybe there's some filters going on. If I just see the preload here, it makes me think that's the only place that we're doing that. That's the only thing that's happening. But that not, might not be the case. The other thing is that if I want genres here in this endpoint, I'll probably want it in other endpoints as well. There has definitely been projects even recently where I've preloaded in like a GraphQL resolver in a couple places, which makes it difficult to know which entities you can fully traverse at that point. 
So by leaving this logic out of the web layer, we make it easier to know where it's all contained, and we get that consistent interface for accessing movies inside the service layer. So here is an example of a service layer in our Letterboxd app. We're at the Movies module. This is what we think of as a context, this overarching container for dealing with movies. So here's our get by ID function we were just looking at. And you can see we moved our preload here as well. We are querying the database here in the repo.get, um, but constructing the queries is delegated to the movie module. So any large application is going to have several of these service layers. Um, many of them, we're going to want to coordinate the implementation details without needing to know where they are. So our boundaries on either side of this service layer are intake and response and the implementation of these queries. So a big reason we're keeping these separate is that it's easier for another person to read and understand what's going on here very quickly. If we have all the queries and mutations in the context, it would take longer to parse through each one. We also keep our database query in the service layer rather than delegating it to these other modules because maybe we want to compose those together, um, queries from several modules to execute here. So with that consideration, we may want to further streamline this by nesting that preload inside the movie module as well. So now instead of a repo.preload, I see movie for ID and then movie with genres and then my repo.get. Comparing this to the previous function, I think this tells us a better story with more human readable language. In this version, I see all the data that I'm trying to get before I make that query. And this also helps when I want to put another filter on it. So if I want to only see movies that have been like stream, that can be streamed from this database, I can just add that into my pipeline. So moving into the schema level, um, this is our movie module that we've been working with. And the first thing I see is this schema. Um, the actual structure of the data for this movie has a name, a release year. It's got relationships to genres, relationships to reviews. Um, it describes everything we need to know about this particular entity. It answers the questions, what is this? What makes it valid? What are its relationships? And it gives us a mental map for the domain that we're working with. It doesn't perform any executions or queries here. We're keeping those in the service layer. It should just be a static description of this entity and how it's stored in the database. In the code bases I work on, we also keep our queries in this module. Um, so below it, I can just see exactly how I'm asking for this data. And a convention that we also use is consistent naming. So we notice we've got four ID and with genres. The consistent naming makes it really easy to recognize what's happening within these at the service layer when they're composed together. So let's look at this pipeline, the functions that we're using to filter and query movies a user is searching for. We've got the list all function in the movies context that takes in parameters to filter by. We're looking for movie in release year, feature length, with genre, genre, with genres. It gets a little bit muddled and confusing, especially when we're looking at the with genre, with genres. I don't know what's filtering, what's preloading. I can make a guess, but that makes it harder on me. If we make this naming consistent, I can easily read this um, and know exactly what's going on. Because in this code base, our convention is that for equals filter by, um, with equals a preload, is or has is going to give us like a Boolean. Um, so it's immediately obvious how we're querying this data. And the other benefit is that because Elixir is dynamically typed, naming these functions becomes even more important because we can't just like know exactly what the type is going in and out. Um, it helps us cognitively to work faster. I don't need to open up the other schema files when I'm trying to understand these queries. Um, and anytime I don't have to go to another file to figure something out, it helps me focus on the harder problems to solve by reducing that cognitive load. So the last layer we're going to look at is the worker layer. Um, this is an example of a worker we might have in the app. Its job is to publish reviews to Twitter whenever I publish it to Letterboxd. And you'll notice we're using Oban here. Um, it's a job processing library that we're using here to coordinate our as asynchronous work. So in here, what we're saying is that when this worker is enqueued, it gets a review ID. It reaches out to the reviews to get the content, and then reaches out to the Twitter deliverer to actually perform the sending. Um, this should be invoked within the service layers, but we also notice that it's delegating back to the service layers. So our boundaries here again, service layer delegates, goes back to the service layers. One more note about workers that I've found helpful is um, grouping them together next to each other. So instead of maybe like 
If you've got a worker that deals with movies, putting it inside of a movie directory. Keeping all the workers together helps when you're making new workers, because you're often referencing that code. You're trying to keep it consistent. You want those files to kind of live nearby. So maintaining the separation of concerns, this is our whole team's responsibility. Um, it's a lot easier to guess where new functionally, functionality fits in uh, if you've got these strong patterns and naming conventions. Um, and it can help if we reinforce this in our PR reviews and our architecture designs. It is going to be imperfect, but whenever you see something that's not quite right, leave an artifact, because then people coming after you will know which pattern is like the accepted pattern. So let's get deeper into the meat of these modules. We're going to talk about functions. And let's first name an intention for writing functions. We want to tell a story of data transformation. We want a story that is human readable. We want to lower that cognitive load as much as possible. Object-oriented programming, programming describes the world through objects and their relationship to each other, whereas functional programming sees the world as acting on data and a series of data transformations. And that is how ideally we want to model our functions, so that we can tell a story to other developers about how the data is changing. The tools I want to talk about here are pipes and pattern matching. And if you don't know what this is, it's anamorphs. Yes. Thank you. There was a lot of really good pictures, but this GIF was the best. Um, so starting with pipes, I want to first show a function that misuses them. We're going back to our letterboxed example. Here we have a context for lists, and we're removing an entry from a list. But there's a lot of other things that have to happen when we do that, right? We, we need to first delete an association, update the list genres, add an activity. Um, and it is possible for me to write this as a piped function, but only if I write the internal functions in a really contrived way. So like here, for delete association, I'm taking the list in the movie, and I'm deleting an association, but I'm not changing either of those things. And then I'm returning them because update list genres needs them, but again, it's just updating maybe the associations to the genre, not the list or the movie. And lastly, we're adding an activity which is totally separate. Like we do need information from these things, but we're not transforming anything. So even though we can technically compose it this way, the pipe is there because it's indicating to us as humans, as developers, that data transformation is taking place. So we're using it to describe the journey of data. And in this function, we're telling too many stories at once. It's difficult to follow the thread. Um, and we're not transforming one piece going into the next. So comparing that to something that does do this, this generate tags uh, function, Let's pretend that we needed to get a single string of all the tags that were already associated with the list. So we're starting with the list itself, and we can see as it goes down, we're, we're getting the tag structs, then turning it into a list of strings, and then adjusting that list, and then joining it all together, and we come out with something different. It's a different version of the data we started with. Um, and this is clearer because now I know when I see this pipe coming in, I'm going to be seeing some data transformation happening. So, what do we do with something like this? We are going to need to do all these things, right? All of these things need to happen with a remove entry. But we can do this in a different way. We don't need to use pipes here. We refactor with something like the with operator. Now this is indicating to developers that each step needs to return an OK before moving to the next one. Um, and maybe you'd want to put this in an ecto multi transaction or something to make sure you could roll back if it all went bad. But basically what we're trying to say is that Function composition with pipes is only worthwhile if you're doing it to convey to another developer that we're seeing this story of data transformation. And that's not happening here. Um, this with operator is the right, right tool for the job. Um, so what we want is choosing a tool that does what you need it to do, but also communicates your intent to other developers. So pattern matching um, is another place that we can look to help us communicate intent. There's a lot of uses for pattern matching, um, but the point that I want to hit on is the way that it communicates to other developers what it's there to do. So here we've got this toggle watched. Um, when someone indicates they've watched something, we pass it in. If the watch stat is nil, we change that to the current time. And if it's uh, not hitting that first function head, we know we need to add it. Um, so then we can see here the branching logic that we expect. Um, we know that once the data comes in here, it's making a choice, and we're going to go either direction. But we can also misuse pattern matching 
when we're trying to show this branching logic and it makes it harder to tell what's going on. So let's look at something like this, like in our um, permissions section of the app. This can do function is gonna take a role struct um, and an action, and then it's gonna just match down the list, right? It finally executes it when it finds the right one. And it does work. This is branching logic, but um, the computer understands it and the humans reading it don't. When I come into this and I'm trying to figure out the relationship of permissions to roles, it's very difficult for me to look at this list and understand that. So the rule of thumb with this pattern is, is it telling a clear story about data? And does it enable others to quickly understand the intention? And if not, we can think about a what a better way to structure this. So here, maybe we just want to pattern match on the role and keep our permissions in a list or a map. It's not that much less performant, <laughs> if it is at all, and it makes it much more clear for when I'm coming to look at this file, what's happening. Lastly, we wanna talk about documentation as clues. This is something that helps me understand the kind of data I should be expecting, the intent of a particular function, maybe the overall architecture of the system that I'm working on. We've got tests. Tests can be clues. Um, when I'm new to a domain, I'm looking at the test to figure out what's happening. Um, I'm looking at the assertions to figure out what the functions are supposed to be doing. It is there to test our code, but it's also a message to the future, right? Saying this is what I hoped this function would be doing. Change it <laughs> if, if it's doing something different, you know? Um, documentation in code. We've got module docs, we've got at docs. These are overviews of what the module is doing, what the functions are doing. It can help serve as caveats to what's happening in your code. Type specs, um, these are guideposts for us, right? Like we talked about before, like this is super helpful to see even if we're not using Dialyzer. And then if we are using Dialyzer, you know, you get that extra benefit. Um, also VS Code can help us out with this too. It's got type spec and analyzing what's happening there. Um, code commentary, people have different feelings about this. Um, I've heard sometimes that if your code is clear, you don't need code comments. And I would just rather you assume that your code is less clear than you think it is and leave your code comments in. We can always take it out if you know, they become extraneous, but generally speaking, um, you have all the context when you write this thing that you kind of miss in a couple months, so keep it in there. Um, lastly, internal documentation. So this is like a tech brief, decision logs, System architecture diagrams, videos. Videos are great. We love to use Loom at Knock. It's helpful to get work in projects, work in progress out, and you get this like artifact that you can go back to and kind of understand what people were thinking at the time. So we leave all these clues to relate intention to a future developer. Um, we want to give ourselves the best chance of maintaining complex systems as possible. So now that we've talked about these code patterns, let's talk about team patterns. This is me with one of my flat iron squads. We all spontaneously dressed alike and also looked sad for some reason. <laughs> I don't remember why. Um, you can see Sophie's there looking beautiful and forlorn. Um, but developing team patterns does not mean that we lose our individuality or our creativity. Um, it doesn't mean we can't introduce new ideas. It just means we're growing a shared vocabulary together and we're able to move faster and with less friction as a result. Um, Sophie actually had a talk about this team at Flatiron School where the three of us, four of us on the Flatiron side were just learning Elixir and the other guys we worked at at another company had no idea, you know, they hadn't written Elixir before, but we still were able to deliver this project ahead of time because we really worked on these shared learnings and conventions as we were building this together. So Elixir does give us all these great tools to write elegant, maintainable code, but we don't have to write it that way. So we're working on behaviors within our teams to help us do that. Um, we're going to want several methods of broadcasting and reinforcing these conventions that we're creating together. And not all of these practices are going to work for every team, uh, and some that do aren't going to work for every person on every team. So this part is more art than science, and it's gonna change as your team dynamics change. Also, we need to remember that there's a few Elixir-specific things that we're working with here. Elixir is still newer, um, it's growing, and it's got a lot of well-documented resources, but less than languages like Ruby. Flora mentioned this earlier, actually, in her talk when she was saying, like, if you're looking for something Python has 
a bunch of resources and uh, for Jupyter Notebooks, and we don't have that for NERVs yet um, in the same way. That's just easily accessible. So when people are coming into your teams, they're going to be relying more on your teams than on outside resources. Um, Elixir has conventions, but it doesn't force your, you to write your code in a coherent way, so we're building that muscle with our team. And it's been a gateway from object-oriented languages into functional, so that's a good perspective to kind of focus on when we're teaching it. So we've got two broad categories that I'm dumping into, onboarding and maintenance, that we can use as touch points um, to ramp up our team and to get us to gel together in this way. In onboarding, we've got a champion, a teacher, and a buddy as roles, general roles. These people are the ones that are gonna help the most um, in these situations. So the champion. This is a person that advocates strongly for Elixir on your team. So when we were at Flatiron School, we were working on a monolith Ruby application, and one of our staff engineers strongly advocated that we use Elixir for some microservices. His job was not to teach us Elixir, but it was to get us excited about it. Um, his energy around it was pretty contagious. He talked about how the developer experience and what we could use in this new project for it. And he also got us time from management to help us get the time we needed to learn it together. So when you're introducing this new tool to your team, if that's the place that you're in, you're going to get the mileage out of somebody who's just there and excited and ready to help you get there. And then when you are learning, we're thinking about teachers and who can be that in our companies. This is actually a slide deck from a talk I did introducing Ruby Elixirs, Ruby developers to Elixir. Um, this is how I came to into Elixir, and I felt like I understood enough about like, my struggles with it to, to help the other people get along there. And then we ended up adapting this into this like, intro to Elixir session that we started doing when I was at Frame.io. Um, and we started this session because we started branching out of hiring just Elixir developers. And unless you're planning on only hiring Elixir developers, you're going to want to make this kind of investment um, in retooling your new hires or junior engineers on your team. And I do think that it is important that we do that because we want our ecosystem and our community to grow. So developers often come into this language from object-oriented backgrounds, and that's a great guess to make when we're thinking of how, how to introduce Elixir. They're familiar with programming concepts, but not necessarily from a functioning, functional angle. So during the session, we introduced high-level functional concepts along with Elixir at a high level. This gave us a place to start with new hires from other languages and also with junior developers. So it's not that they learned everything immediately, right? We can't explain Elixir or functional programming in one session. But I'm thinking back to like when I was in boot camp and I had three months to learn so many things and I didn't retain any of it. But I knew like basically what the concepts coming in were and I knew where to reach out to get them. I knew the people I could go to to explain it to me when I forgot. And that's the importance of this session is just having a touch point where you can say, here's the basics, and you can come back to it, and we can help again. Um, and there's other things that we can do to expand this. Maybe it's more of a, like an ongoing course through onboarding when you have the resources to do that. That's a very exciting space for us to start to explore. And the best part of having this part of onboarding is that you're teaching your new hires within your own code base. So they're learning your conventions as well, and they're getting up to speed there instead of sort of a generic um, intro to Elixir course. So lastly, we're at the buddy. This is Baby Cat and Swamp Cat. These are my coworkers. Um, they do not code very well, but they are very good at emotional support. And so this buddy, like my cats, um, this is somebody that makes you feel safe and welcome. Maybe it's someone who says, reach out to me if you need help when you're new to a place or a company. Um, so something we tried at Frame was assigning like a mentor to new engineers. Um, this was not their manager. It was somebody to come to them with questions um, when they like, weren't quite comfortable asking those questions in a larger group yet. Um, and as your company grows, it is hard to convey patterns one-on-one, -on -one, right? So setting aside this time to work with somebody who's new can be really helpful to help them ramp up quickly. And I think of this less as a mentor and more as like a code buddy or a tour guide, um, especially when we're hiring Elixir developers who don't feel like they need a mentor. Um, they still don't know how your company writes Elixir. They don't know your conventions yet. So it's still helpful to have that person connected with someone specifically when they're joining. And on smaller teams like Knock, this division of champion and mentor and teacher, these are more blended, right? Um, so when I joined, I worked closely with Chris, our CTO, on my first projects, and he introduced me to these patterns and, and conventions on our code base. 
He helped me understand what they were, why they worked that way. Um, and this initial investment is going to enable people to become maintainers of your code base going forward. So this is some of my team at Knock. Um, we read MPEX earlier this year. Um, but outside of the onboarding experience, teams create their own ways of reinforcing these patterns together. We have something like Book Club. This is super helpful when you're actually applying things as you go. Um, when it's more practical than theoretical, I find it most useful. Pairing, this is uh, great to absorb patterns and to start align thinking together. Um, I also really advocate for structured pairing, where you define your roles as driver and navigator, and you, you actually switch off. And if you're brave enough, you can make time for feedback. Um, I know it sounds scary, but this was something that was super helpful when we used to do it at Flatiron School. Um, it also gives, before I go on to the next one, I just want to say, that, like, this gives both people a lot. So it gives the junior engineer time to feel confident about, like, directing something, right? Um, and they also learn from the more experienced engineer. And then the experienced engineer really gets to work on their communication skills and their mentorship abilities. So I think that's super important. Um, engineering Cafe is something we do at Knock, and I've seen iterations of this at other companies where we do every like two weeks or so, um, shared agenda, everybody throws on the board like, these are some of the things that I've been thinking of as a, at a high level that we could change, um, that we could adapt. Uh, and we get to sort of align our thinking there. Then we've got architecture and PR reviews. So these are really good places to help us align our conventions together. Um, you notice where you're breaking them. You can even question if we're doing the things that we want to be doing at this point in time. And speaking of those, we have this shared conventions doc that I really like at NOC. Um, this is somewhere where we write down the way that we write Elixir. Uh, this isn't the whole thing, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that we talk about here. Uh, we usually talk about this in our engineering cafe also. But um, you know, we're not going to remember this 100% of the time. I don't have this document memorized. But some of your developers are going to remember it some of the time, and then they can help you get back on track in code reviews and architecture reviews. Lastly. Tooling, if we're just relying on our behavior to enforce these patterns, we will lose them. So these are some nice tools to use. We've got mix format, which formats our code, and mix credo, which looks for inconsistencies in our CI pipeline. So we don't merge our PRs without those um, passing. Boundary is an Elixir library that you can use for separation of concerns. So if I had that, I wouldn't be calling like the web layer from my service layer, for instance. Xdoc generates docs for you. That can help also reinforce like writing at docs and module docs. Um, and as our community and ecosystem grows, I'm sure these will grow with it. And if you have others that you're already using, like definitely shout them out later. Um, I'm sure there's some I don't know about. So basically, coming to the end of this, it's most of what I wanted to talk about today. We talked about patterns in a code base, um, why help, having them can help us grow faster, stronger and the behaviors that can help reinforce them. But there's one more thing that I want to leave you with, and I think that's the most important part of all of this. When you are creating and maintaining clear patterns in your code, and you're building a shared vocabulary with your team, you're actually part of a bigger movement, and that is democratizing software engineering, particularly for minority communities. We want our industry to be accessible. We want it to be welcoming. Diversity is something that we say that we're interested in. But our demographic is still very white, is still very male, about 80% in the US. Those numbers really haven't changed that much in like 10 years. Um, the field is still mostly accessible for people who came through uh, academic routes. Boot camps have become more popular in the last few years. Um, and it is still very accessible mostly for native English speakers. Um, they don't have the extra cognitive load of translating code and documentation. And we don't want to lose the community that we have. Um, we do want to make space for minority communities to join us in a career that has been very rewarding in so many ways. So there's a lot of reasons why we've struggled to make our teams and organizations more diverse and more global. But I think that one of the biggest hurdles to inclusivity is that when one community has been in the, in the majority for a long time, they develop an unspoken understanding with each other. A community that's together for this long creates a shared vocabulary organically and they know the protocol and patterns that are expected of them. 
Engineers in this space sometimes prioritize building a feature quickly and knowledge sharing coming second, since they feel like everyone is already on the same page. There have been times when I've been told that I should have just known how something was done or what was expected, and I have been in the position of trying to guess what the patterns and protocols should be. And this isn't out of animosity. It's most of the time not to gatekeep others out. I think it's usually because we can be unaware that this gap exists. Patterns and processes do feel like a burden to the people that are already in the know. It feels like you're slowing down unnecessarily. But without them, it can keep another group of people from reaching their potential on a team because we force them to guess instead of giving the answers that we already have. It can lead to the perception that the second group just isn't as capable when really they're starting at a disadvantage. And at best, this is inefficient from a business perspective because now we've got a part of our team that can't fully participate. But at worst, this unintentional exclusion goes against the values that we share as a community. But we can do our small part to help transform things within our organizations. By not expecting people to know what they were never told, let's write down our protocols and our processes so everyone can access them. By setting up and communicating patterns so that people can start on the same footing. By writing code for our future teammates and future selves to read and understand and by being superstar developers by prioritizing building up our team as much as we do our product. To me, this is what good behavior looks like, and this is the kind of company I want to keep. Thank you. Meryl, thank you so much, um, especially that last section. I was just kind of sitting here nodding my head aggressively. Um, I have lots of questions. I'm sure other people do as well. But real quick, would you mind going back to the previous slide? Because I just want to take a picture of it and show it to any free buddy that I've ever met. Everyone that I know. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, any questions from folks in the room? Yeah, Adolfo. Hi, nice to Hello, thank you. And uh, the, the first part of the, the patterns, do you think the community could benefit from a catalog of code smells specific for Elixir? Yeah, and I think that we have, I think that those have come up organically from other, from people in the community already, right? Like we know that there's like good and bad Elixir. Um, there's a lot of blogs about this and like people's opinions on this. And I do see the benefit of maybe trying to find some shared conventions around that. Uh, maybe going back to the keynote today in some ways where it's like, let's talk about this more openly and like in bigger spaces. So I, I don't know. I think like that's a, a cool thing to reach for. But the most important thing is in our teams, I think like for us to keep growing and to keep reinforcing these, like that's where we can start is just like on that micro level of like within a team, having these conventions be pretty um, standardized. Uh, are your slides going to be available somewhere? Yes, <laughs> I can, okay. yes. Because I, I know some people that are doing research on code smells for Elixir, I'm going to send. Awesome, yeah, of course, definitely, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you both, and the talks will be published um, online eventually, so you'll also be able to share it that way. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> I know I can rely on the uh, hello. Uh, hello. First of all, nice talk. I Thank really you. love it, like the concepts that you presented us today. Um, first of all, like to just to, to help Adolfo, I know there's a really cool project about like code smells and good patterns in Elixir on GitHub. I don't remember its name now, but like usually we use it at work when we are not sure if we're oh, doing that's the awesome. best patterns. So probably. So you're pointing your team to this other. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and my question is, like, uh, I've seen a lot of concept for, concepts from the Clean Code book in your, your talk. I would like to know if, like, it's a book that we recommend or if you have another book, like, with good practices in general, like, in the industry or in code practices to, to recommend us. I have not personally read Clean Code, but I've gleaned a lot from it because we've been on teams that we've like referenced it heavily. So I've not gone through the whole thing, but I think we've referenced a lot of like the thinking in those books. So yeah, I think that that's a great place to start. Um, and I think in general, like having these resources like you're talking about on GitHub and stuff, like that's, a, that's also a, a nice place to start that journey um, as you build up your muscle within your team for it. 
So Clean Code is a place. I know that Chris Keithley has a blog on good and bad Elixir that a lot of people have referenced and talked about in the last like couple months. Um, and taking some of these things that we have from more established languages and, and trying to apply it here is, is also worthwhile, but we need to think about the Elixir concerns specifically as well that are going to change in like those contexts. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you both. Um, all right, any other questions? So many. Okay, we'll start over here. I was curious. Um, I assume NAC is, like you, you, you said you helped found it. No, I oh. didn't. I'm oh. a founding engineer. Oh, okay, sorry. But you know. But you were involved in the beginning, right? So, uh, yeah, close to it. I was. I started in December. Yes. So I'm curious. Do you, like, do you have experience balancing, having to meet, deliverables like MVPs for funding funders mm -hmm. that may not be able to compl may not be infinite, long lived applications and may not have time to meet all these standards and like have you been in situations where you have to balance that and yeah definitely i think that like i said earlier I th this is very much an art the balancing act is real like startups especially have to make weigh these competing priorities of here's a deadline also I, I don't want to incur technical debt by putting in some code that's going to be difficult to get out in the future um, and I think what's nice is that we have a pretty good balance of personalities on our team as well. So there are people on our team who really prioritize that like technical precision, clean code, communication. And then we have competing uh, people like me a lot of the time that like kind of wants to get things out faster and can tend to like pull back on like the, the code cleanliness or the communication sometimes when I'm trying to work really fast. Um, so partly it's those people working out the balance together um, and it's having somebody who's pushing forward while the other person is trying to pull back a little bit. Um, but the other thing that we do is we actually do go back and clean stuff up. So if there is something that we put in that we know we need to fix, we have tickets for it and we don't just put it into a backlog that never gets picked up again. That's something that we bring up at engineering cafe meetings. Um, that is something that like, we really prioritize because we are very cognizant of the fact that we're moving very fast and we need to deliver, but that we don't want to put ourselves in a bad place in the future. So I think that that's part of it is like having a team dynamic that can help and also writing notes for the future on things um, to get stuff cleaned up. So something that maybe like doesn't have tests, like a backfill test, backfill like job that doesn't have tests or something like going back and putting tests there or like cleaning a section up is really important. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Meryl. I think we had another question. This gentleman over here, part of me, thank you. This, I guess, kind of related to the previous question, what you were talking about. Uh, I really like all the stuff you've been saying, but I was wondering what kind of challenges you run into in trying to implement these things and, and how you deal with that, because I don't think they all happen just by themselves. When you say implement these things, do you mean like patterns? Like the team patterns and, mm. and behaviors, and not the code so much. Oh, but the, the team patterns. Things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So challenges that come up with that is, I think one of the ones that comes up a lot is that you can start a team pattern and then your team changes, right? And so the, that goes away. Um, or the, the dynamic of the people on the team shifts. And so it is a very active, uh, you play a very active role when you're implementing team patterns. It isn't something that's gonna stay around forever. Um, Book club does not make sense at every company. <laughs> like it, it makes sense at certain times for certain teams in certain spaces. And I think it's something that we share the responsibility of figuring out. So some of the challenges there in some of the things that I was talking about, like pairing, for instance. We have a very small team at Knock. It is not easy to pull somebody off their project to pair with me on mine. I think that that's very, like it's very worthwhile when it happens, but it is not something we can do all the time. Um, and th again, it's just like that balancing act of saying like, what is important right now? The times when I really do want it and I need it, like I will schedule time with somebody in a week when I say like, this is when I really want to work on this with you, or this is a problem I think that would benefit us from working together. Um, 
So like planning for it and having that be part of your team values is really important, I think, as well. So if this is something that's important to you, your team should share the like, responsibility of making it happen. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think like as you grow, it, it can be really hard to keep these things together. And like I said, pulling in people from other teams, like people hiring and stuff. Um, one of the pitfalls I find that happens is when a team gets very big, you start to sort of like have this inner group of architects or engineers that are like actually the ones that know about the patterns. Um, and it can feel, start to feel a little cloistered. So that's something to be really aware of as well, is like not artificially making these in-groups and out-groups within your organization and striving to keep it as open as possible. Um, both are challenging, but I think one uh, you'll reap more value from in the future. Did that sort of answer what you were asking? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep going. But, um, we can talk more as well. Uh, other questions? from people in the room. Um, I have a question, I have a few questions, so I'm just gonna hog the mic for a little bit. Um, slightly less serious question. When you showed us the slide with your like Elixir sort of design agreements, um, was that on Notion by chance? Yes, we use Notion. Notion. Notion is a great tool, we love it. We, we use don't it work for, for Notion, our but uh, we do really love it. <laughs> love Notion. <laughs> Notion and Loom, these are two tools that we love, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, anybody else before I just continue to hog this? Was it hard to pick only one picture of me for your slide deck? It was. <laughs> there are many beautiful pictures of Thank Soapy, you. but this one, we were dressed alike, yeah. so. <laughs> Excellent. Ask Meryl about the happy hour later. Oh, yes. <laughs> there is a happy hour. I hear there might be two. Maybe so. two competing happy hours, Christopher. Yeah. We're, We'll, we'll be communicating about those happy hours yeah. at some point. <laughs> so people will let you know what happens. Know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we wrap it up? All right, Merrell, thank you so much for an thank incredible you. and inspiring talk.